Hi, I'm Mark, producer of Roundtable, a TV series born here in New York City at the legendary Manhattan Neighborhood Network Studios. The exchange of ideas is important, and that is why we bring to you the following presentation. Please watch. Good evening and welcome to Single Shot Show at Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Tonight we will be talking about uh, currencies of the art market. We actually have this unique opportunity to get some insight from a person who knows both sides of uh, what's happening with the art market today. The auctions, the secondary market and uh, the galleries. So we have uh, an an owner of uh, Absalon Gallery and uh, the director of Fi Auctions, our own New York auction, Marcelo Zimla. Hello, Marcelo. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you tonight. very much for having me, Alex. Um, uh, as I understand, uh, the biggest change in the art market with uh, everything we was experiencing was, uh, in fact, uh, the virtualization of it. The uh, process became way more digital than everybody expected. And uh, as I know, the Phi Auctions actually is uh, conceived and uh, thought from the very beginning as the venue that is primarily working with their uh, virtual process. Correct. And uh, as I understand, it was uh, very helpful in uh, this changing situation. Definitely, yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, I actually started Phi Auctions uh, trying to uh, capitalize on that trend. Uh, so the trend was already in motion, right? Mm -hmm. Everything, not just the art industry, fashion and a lot of other uh, creative industries in a way, they were all embracing the digital, trying to complement the online with the brick and mortar to enhance the experience. So I just thought that it would be a good time to, to join in. This was already a few years ago. But with the current situation, it only accelerated what was already happening. So uh, you think this uh, trend basically receiving this huge push, basically out of necessity, people had to capitalize more on uh, virtual presence instead of personal presence. But uh, do you think it uh, will continue and uh, we will stay in uh, this direction of development of the art market or uh, it will to a degree reverse when it will become possible? I don't, I don't really think this will reverse uh, at all. I mean, we've already seen the marquee uh, auctions uh, pioneered by other houses, uh, in particular Sotheby's and Chris's. These are, uh, these are broadcasted sales, essentially, joining all of the different branches they have scattered throughout the world. Uh, so. Digital, digitalization enables you to do exactly that. And I really think that once we're past this whole situation with the pandemic, all of that will remain. We will, we will regain the brick and mortar, so we will be able to add that to the mix. But all of this push forward with digitalization and broadcasting and all of these multimedia things will just stay there to make the experience even richer which is essentially what it's all about. It's a, it's a, it's a collecting experience for, for, for clients. Well, yeah, as I understand, the most uh, complicated thing to overcome uh, when you're talking about uh, online and in general virtual sales of the art pieces is to actually give people enough uh, feel of the object yes. through uh, without actually having physical presence of it. But if you think about it, when you're talking about uh, places like uh, Christus or Sotheby's, uh, the physical uh, presence of the object wasn't really that available even at the brick and mortar events. Most of the people wouldn't uh, have an opportunity to actually come and experience the object in it's person. True. It's true. And you know, there's something also that you should you know, keep in mind. 
even if you're able to inspect something in person, you're relying on your eyes and your own sensibility to be able to assess the condition of the artwork. Uh, many times, whether you're older or you have some kind of condition, you won't, really, you won't be able to, to see the full, <laughs> the full detail of the work, even if you're standing right in front of it. Well, it's not only that. Uh, in uh, the auction room, only the first few rows actually have good enough look at what they're looking at. Oh, right, right. But, I mean, uh, usually, uh, you know, the auction houses, they have viewing sections, which usually... Uh, extend for probably one or two weeks prior to the auction a day when when we're talking about a, a, a live auction right that mm -hmm. takes then takes place during one session or two uh, so you are actually able to inspect it uh, but you know as I said before you're relying on your own senses and nowadays with photography and video and all of these other uh, mediums uh, you can complement and many times surpass what you were able to do before with all of these technologies. So with the online process, you can actually add a lot more information to, to the collector than what you had previously. Absolutely, and uh, not to mention that it actually allows uh, for much more diversified geography of both buyers Definitely. and sellers. Definitely. It's obvious that uh, if it's online, everybody can buy from anywhere in the world as long yes. as they're willing to pay for shipping. But uh, yes. Not a lot of people realize that uh, if you're talking about purely online event, it's possible to have uh, somebody from the other end of the globe actually be offering it in this auction, yeah. which is an impossibility for a brick and mortar. Well, and you know, you know, just to give you an example, you know, we were founded just a few years ago, uh, and we've been dealing with people from Asia and Europe pretty much since our inception. <laughs> Something that for a brick and mortar, you know, thinking back, you know, a few years ago would have been unthinkable. Absolutely. Unthinkable. And now, you know, it's just like a routine. <laughs> yes, uh, and uh, Asia is uh, one of the fastest growing markets, if yes. not the fastest growing market right now. And they have a big appetite for uh, creative things, in particular fine art. It used to be the case, uh, especially in China that Chinese collectors would only focus on Chinese-made work by Chinese artists. But since recently, maybe two or three years ago, they've opened up, and now they're also looking for Western art, European, African. They're really looking for other things that they can't already get in, in China. Interesting. It's actually a very uh, unusual transition. Uh, most of the time, uh, any culture, especially the culture that is uh, in most of the aspects of its existence is focused on itself, uh, pretty much is uh, favoring uh, art of this culture. I can give a, as an example uh, the Russian culture as well. Mm. The uh, interest to the Russian artists in uh, Russian communities are uh, uncomparable to that in uh, any other market. Right. No, definitely, definitely. I mean, if we are just focusing on the Chinese uh, art, uh, well, it's important to, to note that uh, the highest uh, auction record for an Asian artist is a Chinese French artist. His name is Sao Wu Qi, mm -hmm. and he was part of the uh, Paris School of um, Abstraction, right? Uh, of which San Francis and others were also a part of. And this, uh, this record was claimed in China, in Asia, so they they enabled this. Uh, so even though they they do have an appetite for other types <laughs> of work outside of Asia, even uh, they they still favor very much uh, Chinese artists. Sao Wu Qi, an example, and then there's others like Zhuo Minjun and others like like them. Wow, oh, that's just another sign of globalization, which is definitely underlined by. Uh, the whole process of virtualization of the auctions. Yes, yes, definitely. And this will, this will only continue uh, the way it is and, you know, accelerate, probably. Well, uh, I know for a fact that a lot of people actually missing the ability to have the physical art events because it's not always just about buying artwork. Yes. But uh, in general, this trend uh, offers something that is one of the most valuable commodities in contemporary world comfort.
It's true. I do think that for the commercial part of of things, uh, this will this will uh, this this will prove to be a benefit really for it. It will enhance the experience, the buying experience. Um. Uh, but for appreciating art as it is, say at museums or art fairs, uh, you still need you still need the brick and mortar, and you still need to be able to stand in front of a painting and admire it and stare at it. Uh, there's no there's no replicating that with a computer. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Uh, well, in the end of the day, uh, the subject of what people are buying is still a physical object that they yes. either want to have on their wall or put in their... Exactly, yes. It exists somewhere. Sandbox. Maybe yes. not in front of them, but it does exist somewhere. Well, that's uh, also the whole different discussion of digital and virtual art, but right. uh, that's a too big of a discussion to cover it right now. We will be going into a break in a few minutes, mm -hmm. and uh, probably after the break we can uh, look into... Uh, what kind of changes in the types of the artwork being sold on the auction. Uh, definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's actually the whole separate subject and there are definitely a lot of changes that we experienced. Yeah. So we will be back in a few minutes, right minutes well. and continue. Excellent. This is Alex AG from uh, Single Shot with another single trick. Tonight I want to tell you a little bit about post-production. There is one feature in uh, Photoshop and many other photo editing programs that being used uh, scarcely. That's channels. And uh, there is only one reason why it is so. Nobody understands what it is for. Well, not nobody, but a lot of people don't. So when you see an image just like this, uh, you are getting in channel that. And that's very counterintuitive because you actually supposed to be seeing this. Three separate sets of color, not of grayscale. So if you would think of each channel as specific color, for example, of red being red instead of grays, blue being blue instead of uh, grays, and green likewise, you'll uh, find channels very useful for editing. All right, we're back, and uh, we was promising to discuss how the tastes of the collectors changed because of the virtualization and uh, all of the occurrences of the moment of all the changes and dynamics we have in our society. That's so, right. yes. did you notice anything specific that uh, I changed? Have. <laughs> I have. Do so you? I can tell you specifically uh, that right now uh, demand for a Japanese artist by the name of uh, Takashi Murakami, is through the roof, <laughs> right? And you know, for, for those of you who are not that familiar with the artist's uh, aesthetic, uh, he, he invented something called super flat, which is essentially a style that draws from popular Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. Say, uh, manga, anime, all of these type of cartoon uh, things, you know, he draws from a lot of that, and also from traditional techniques of Japanese art. And then he twists everything and presents them in a very cheerful and happy way. So the result of this is his signature smiley flowers. Right. So this is a, these are essentially backgrounds filled entirely with smiley flowers, <laughs> with little faces in there. And then we also have some others that pull a lot more from uh, what is a traditional um, Japanese art with the drips and you know uh and the inks and the uh sfumatos and all of that well it makes total sense uh, it does. when <laughs> uh, 
A lot of people feel an uncertainty and depression. Uh, they naturally would be looking towards something that would be cheerful on their wall and would be Definitely. entertaining them. Definitely, so, yes. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, virtual versus brick and mortar, uh, do you think there is anything that uh, became to be more appealing for the viewers uh, be just because they not physically experiencing the object and probably can uh, appreciate it in more logical way? Well, I can tell you this. Uh, there's been a marked trend uh, specifically since the, the onset of this pandemic uh, that for some reason auctions have taken the lead in the industry and obviously the commercial galleries which you know for the most part rely heavily on the brick and mortar spaces for shows yeah. and exhibitions all that have been put in the back burner. Uh, so that's exactly what we're seeing now. Uh, demand for, for things being auctioned off is, is through the roof. I mean, the numbers are really high, uh, and well, for commercial, uh, it's, it's, it's essentially decreased pretty much by the same percentage that the auctions have increased, right? Because in a way, the, there's been a redistribution, right, of you know, how mm -hmm. people are purchasing work. So I can tell you now that in this current setting where people are not able to go out and inspect things for themselves, uh, they find it a lot easier and convenient to just get on their computers or mobile phones and just look through the lots and the photographs and the video that's available for each one, and they'll be able to make a purchase decision pretty much on the spot or in a matter of days. So now timed auctions, uh, which are pretty much the standard for online auctions, tend to uh, take about two weeks. So that's the... Uh, that's the preferred length uh, for, for, this, uh, for these auctions. And that, based on the data, uh, is, the, is the time that people require to, to go from uh, interest to, uh, to finish the, the purchase, uh, the purchase intent. Well, uh, and uh, that period of time is, let me guess, two weeks. Yeah, that's right, yes. Yeah, that's actually interesting. Well, it makes total sense because uh, even for people who uh, buy an art routinely, uh, it's still most of the time quite a uh, sum to consider. So two weeks is probably about uh, time yeah. for them to uh, make their choice. Uh, well, as we know, there are majorly uh, three motivations why people buy an art. One, yes. interior purposes. To uh, emotional connection with the art piece. Yes, personally. And the yes. third one is uh, investment. That's right. So, uh, as, a, as I understand for the auction uh, scenery, investment is the uh, always been uh, more important than it is for uh, gallery scene and for primary market in general. And probably at some point we'll discuss the differences of one and another, but. Yes. Uh, uh, what do you think uh, was uh, the ratio of uh, emotional purchases versus uh, uh, investment purchases was affected by this whole situation? I would imagine that probably to a degree it had to be. To be honest, uh, I don't really, I haven't really seen a redistribution uh, based on based on those uh, parameters. So people, for the most part, still buy art primarily for personal purposes. Uh, investment is, is always there, still in their mind, because no one, no one would ever be buying into something knowing perfectly well that that will decrease in value over time. Yeah, so sure. at the very least, it should, it should keep its value, right? Uh, but for the most part, people still buy art for personal reasons and because they think it will be a great addition to their, to their collections, it will keep its value, and it will make a very nice uh, addition to their interiors, right? Some people are advised by, in, by uh, advisors, interior designers, all of these kinds of people. Some go solo, right? And, and that's okay. Uh, that's okay. Uh, because the, the, the purpose of the, of the purchase is, is, remains still pretty much the same. So it's always uh, some kind of combination between the personal and the decorative uh, aspect and keeping the investment there in check, making sure that this is 
this is not something that will end up, you know, just losing entire value over time. Well, uh, when it comes to primary market, it's uh, actually more of a, uh, of a gamble. Uh, yes, yes, it is. Because uh, over uh, over there, the most of the purchase is actually emotional. You don't have this two weeks period. Right. Uh, so just the elimination of that, uh, in a way, probably influenced what's happening with the auctions. But uh, maybe it indeed wasn't that much. Another thing that probably influenced uh, what's happening with uh, the auction purchases is the uh, situation in which interior design is right now. Because mm. simply because of the lockdowns, of the changes in the uh, situation of people, uh, the interior design industry is in crisis, just like many others. So yes. that probably was changed. Uh, the works that specifically would be bought for interior right now is probably less in demand than something that person would buy for him or herself. It's true. It's true. And, you know, there's something else that I would like to add to this. So within the interior design, you have to be mindful of the price range within that. Uh, so based on the data, uh, because I really, I really, you know, stay on top of data. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's really clear by now. Uh, so essentially, based on the reports that have been published since, you know, the onset of the pandemic, the things that have suffered the most are the higher price tickets. Uh, so uh, artwork from artists that were very much in demand up mm -hmm. until the pandemic and onwards, say uh, Joey Kusama or David Hockney or even uh -huh. Koss. Right, Brooklyn yes. based. Um, this is still in demand, but people are not willing to pay the prices these things were selling for right up until the, uh, the pandemic. So things are still selling, but at a discount. So things that would typically go for half a million, maybe, now they're probably selling at 200,000. <laughs> well, that's an interesting change. Well, get back to it after the break. Excellent. Today in single shot I'm going to tell you how to make a makeshift pinhole camera. It's actually very simple. All you need is a business cut. I'm gonna use mine but you can use any. You need to apply two pieces of duct tape on it just like this so they will be overlapping each other and right in the middle of the cut from the inside pierce a small hole. The smaller and rounder it is, the better will be your result. And put this contraption right on the camera, so uh, the hole is right in the middle of the lens space. Then point it at what you would like to take a picture of, put the camera on delay, and take the shot. Voila! You have your pinhole camera shot. Thank you and watch us on YouTube. Alright, we're back and uh, we have uh, only a couple of minutes left and uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is uh, the difference between an online art auction, the proper uh, one like Fi Auctions, uh, from uh, general uh, online auctioning platforms like for example eBay because a lot of people who used to the traditional way of uh, uh, buying artwork from physical location, so the physical auction, yeah. simply don't understand how is it different. Well, yes, I mean, um, you know, probably most people are, are already aware of, you know, what eBay looks like. Absolutely. And, you know, when it comes to artwork, there are uh, a few other things that you have to take into consideration. 
So one of the key things for a dealer or an auction house is reputation. So you're buying from a specific name because you trust them, right? And they, in a way, guarantee you authenticity and all of these things. You were, were you to have an issue down the road, you can always go back to them. With eBay, I don't know how, how clear-cut that, that is. Well, the eBay essentially is just a platform, a tool that allows one person to uh, communicate information right, to they, another. Right, they match, yes, yes, yeah. buyers and sellers. Mm. Uh, there's a few other things that, that come into it. Uh, there is, of course, the reputation, but then, then there is, you know, uh, supplying additional uh, documentation and research. Many times provenance has to be checked, right, because that's one of the things that tell you about the the, uh, the authenticity of the thing when mm -hmm. you don't have like a physical certificate with you, which most things in particular prints don't have. So provenance sure. is key in that case. And then other things like condition that greatly affect the value of, uh, of a print impression. Uh, since there's multiples of it, condition really makes it stand out from the rest of the available body of work. Mm -hmm. So essentially, uh, even though uh, a venue like this is still a platform that connects buyer and a seller, yes. what, as I understand, is uh, the most important part of this is uh, basically the additional information and additional service provided, basically the uh, way for both buyers and sellers to describe and understand the item properly so it would actually make sense, right. which most of the time in uh, platforms where there is none of this available is an impossibility and of course uh, the opportunity to trust it. Definitely. Well, thank you very much Marcelo. It was thank you, extremely enlightening and I really hope that we will see a lot of uh, this tendency going on it's definitely making our world more comfortable and more open to art yes thank you very much for having me found that worth watching as much as I did. I'm Mark for Roundtable. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Bye.